Last week, I preached a sermon that left some questions purposely. One thing I love about expository preaching, or chapter by chapter, line by line, is one open-ended question will be answered in the next chapter. Last week, when I preached on uh, two things, where does the law fit in upon salvation? And we say... Salvation is by grace and grace alone. Salvation is only by the Lord Jesus Christ and His death on the cross for our sins. We even say, by faith unto grace, not of circumcision, uncircumcision, and all the parts of the law. Last week I also opened a question up purposely about how do we come across, across to others? Are we critical in spirit? To them? Do we look at others with a harsh spirit to be criticism like the world around us? And how we need to be soft. And someone came to me, which I knew would come after service, says, Daryl, does that mean we never correct somebody? And I say, Oh, not at all. Then what's the difference? I say, The difference is what side of grace you are on. You see, when we're on the side of laws, we use the laws, and the laws bring a curse and condemnation and guilt. And when you criticize somebody under guilt, it knocks them down. It hurts their feelings. It discourages them. But when you come to somebody on the side of grace and God's love, and you're their biggest fan... You're their encourager. You're their helper to reach their goals in life. You're right beside them every step of the way. And you come to them and say, you know, I think we could do this a little better. You see, they already know your love for them. And on that side of grace, corrective instruction is welcomed. But at first, it's all about the love of Christ in you. You see, our faith and in the sign in front... Our faith always needs to express itself through love. Now we come to this part in Galatians chapter 3. This is the question that would come out, focal thought. You say, O oh Paul, that the law cannot justify. Surely then the law is good for nothing. What purpose then does the law serve? If it will not save a man, what is the good of it? If and of itself it will never take a man to heaven, why was it written, is it not a useless thing? Hey, and listen folks, there's a lot of churches today, they don't preach the law, they don't preach sin, they don't preach in a way that would make people feel guilty of sin. They just, you know, want to encourage you to have a good day and, and they've left sin out of the equation or the law. And today we're going to answer that question, at what cost? So, I got good news for you. I am a proud daddy of three new cows. <laughs> That's right. They're little jerseys. And if anybody doesn't know Jersey cows, they are so neat. So, they're like two weeks old and three weeks old. Three cows. I've named them for the service a little differently than I named them on Facebook. The one cow is um, Big Piggy. The second one is Big Skinny, and the third cow is Little Skinny. That's how I know them apart. So at that age, since they're so young, you have to milk, uh, feed them milk. With, we got big bottles, baby bottles that big. So we go out there, and the guy we bought them from gave us 20 gallons of milk. And so we, we got milk, we're feeding them. So I went out there the first day, and they're so little. And now Big Piggy, he chases me. Everywhere I go with that bottle, he chases me. He will drink it all until he falls over in, in a coma. He just drinks and drinks. Now, Big Skinny, at first it ran from me. So now in the backyard, it's kind of slippery. And when a backyard has cows in it for a little bit, it gets more than kind of slippery. <laughs> so here I am in my boots, chasing Big Skinny. Finally got him quartered against the fence and grabbed him between my legs, squeezed him with my knees, grabbed his mouth, head up, bottle in. And then after a little bit, he just started drinking. And he just drank. And we made friends. And Big Skinny, hopefully, will be bigger and not skinny soon. I didn't have to force feed him. 
And then there's Little Skinny. Little Skinny runs fast too. So I chase down Little Skinny and I put the bottle in his mouth and he won't eat. He just, anything. And I'm like, you gotta eat or you're gonna die. So being a farmer that I am, Got him against the fence, holding him down, got the leg, the mouth, head up, and I got to push off Big Piggy because he's fighting me for the bottle trying to find, feed Little Skinny. So as I got there, I got my hand in his mouth, opened up his mouth, put the nipple in, and then taking my hand, squeezing the nipple of the big bottle and making the milk go down. And he fought me. And I was like, okay, the next day, chase him down again, this yesterday, him, then all of a sudden he realized this is a good thing and little skinny starts drinking so I fought off big piggy for a half hour last night feeding little skinny cow and he ate and you say why this story you see the law is a lot like a cow unto a person don't go compare your spouse to a cow. Don't do that. That is not the message. The message is we are like cows. Just at first how that cow didn't want the milk, fought the milk. The flesh fought me grabbing them. The flesh fought against it. So are we with the law of God. I remember there were years in my life, all the commandments, all the do's and don'ts, my flesh would fight them. And our flesh always fights them, don't they? in certain ways. But just like the cow, the milk is the very best thing for it. And for us, God's law is the very best thing for us to hear. It has purpose. And if we are a smart cow, we'll learn. Smart people. We'll learn not to fight the Word of God. And all of a sudden we start listening to the Word of God, receiving the Word of God, consuming the Word of God, and realizing the Word of God is so powerful. And I have learned the Word of God brings you to grace. Grace brings you into God's favor. And you can have a blessed life no matter what your state, sickness or in health. But the Word of God always has purpose. So today the Apostle brings in Galatians chapter 3, the purpose of the Word of God unto the soul. So let's stand, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. If you're able to, please stand, if you're able only, and we'll have the reading of God's holy Word. Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. Galatians starts off with saying, Oh foolish Galatians, verse 1. Verse 3, Are you so foolish? That's because they're fighting against the Word of God and where it fits in. Now comes the answer, verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through the angels by the hand of the mediator. Now the mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. If the law then, is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a lawgiver which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And this is a powerful message. I pray you'll be blessed today. Let's bow, we'll pray, and we'll sit down, and I'll preach. Father God, I bless this word. Help us to understand the purpose of the law in our lives on both sides of the law and of grace and in you, Christ. I do ask this, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> So God brings us now, all of a sudden, what good is the law? And 
you know, a lot of churches are right there. Oh, we don't preach sin because we don't want people to feel guilty. We don't want people to have their toes stepped on. You know, last Sunday was one of those messages you just preach. I had one fellow who I love so dearly came to me and he says, you know what I like about you preacher? You just preach it and it doesn't matter to you whose toes you step on is what he was saying. Doesn't matter if they're very prominent in the church or not. You just preach it and if it steps on their toes, it steps. You see, sometimes God's word will step on our toes. It will prick our conscience. It will bring us to a point of feeling guilty. And through that guilt, God is working. He's moving. God forbid the churches that no longer preach in such a way that lives will be transformed by God's Word. So God has a purpose of His law. The first purpose of the law is to bring us to how and to know how sinful, exceedingly sinful sin is. Chapter 3, Galatians, verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. The law was to bring us to a point to understand that our sin is against God. <coughs> it was added to make us feel the cost of sin. A lot of times today, we don't like to feel sinful. America's changing in ways. They don't want people to feel their ways contrary to the Bible are sinful. We'd rather change the laws of the land than to accept God's law is for the land. It breaks my heart to see the United States of America change in my lifetime and I am yet not quite middle-aged, don't correct me. So, this last year we had laws passed that legalized marijuana in many states. A drug that any law officer, school teacher, and many of our parents will tell you has destroyed many lives as a leading into deeper trouble. We have seen the United States of America change laws on what is marriage. We have seen, we've taken the Ten Commandments out of many of our institutions. They stood. And we dare to question Will there be a cost? And I say the cost is great. And we need to repent as a nation. We may not be able to control the direction of a nation, but we can certainly control this body of believers in our homes and spread the gospel. I think the scariest thing the United States is going through isn't in a financial crisis, it's a moral crisis. And we turn from God, we'll lose His favor. And that is a scary thing. The purpose of the tutor of the law is for all people to know right and wrong. And that we can choose right, be convicted of wrong. And wrong has a cost. The first thing the law does, it lets us know is sin is very sinful. The next thing the law does is bring into our lives that sin brings conviction and guilt. Galatians 3, 22. But the scripture has confined all under sin. What is the purpose of the law? Makes sin sinful. Sinful enough that the soul has guilt. I ever tell you the first time I knew my son Daniel was saved? Right after this, I followed through with baptism at 70 years old. I think I told the church once. He came home one day and he said, Daddy, I've done a bad thing. I said, what'd you do, son? And guilt was eating him alive. He says, I stole the neighbor's fossils, Daddy. I said, son, you stole the neighbor's fossils? We lived in a little farm area there also in Florida. 
I said, well, son, what must we do? He said, we got to go, Daddy, and tell him and ask him for forgiveness. My neighbor was a big man. Kind of rough on the exterior, but very loving. His name was Zepp. I said, when Zepp comes home, you'll hear his big truck. Yes, Daddy. I said, when he comes home, you get me. We're going to go and repent and give him back. Say, we're sorry. You see, little Daniel 7 had guilt before God, and he couldn't live without making it right. That day, we went over to Zepp's. Step was bigger than me. We looked up at Zepp. And little Daniel's like this. And I said, go ahead. Tell Zepp what happened. He said, Zepp, I stole from you and I'm, I'm sorry. I, forgive me. But he was in a broken voice, scared of what may happen next. And Zepp said, you stole from me, son? He goes, yes, you're fossils. And Zepp says, where were, my, where were those fossils at? He says, out in your garden. Zepp looked at me and he says, a couple weeks ago, I shot a rabbit eating my tomatoes, Daryl. He took the bones. He looked at Daniel and he says, Son, you're forgiven. Daniel got a big smile on his face. Let's go home, Daddy. I said, let's go, son. You done good. See, you know he did wrong. The purpose of the law is to bring conviction unto sin, unto guilt. And guilt takes us to a point to make it right. Guilt has an amazing effect on lives. You see, when we fall and understand that sin is sinful and stands between us and God, the guilt will bring us to a point to find correction. Jesus Christ is that correction of sin. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. For as many are, of, many are of the works of the law are under the curse. The Bible says under the law and under guilt, under a curse. I lived the first 27 years of my life under curse. I know what it's like to live under the curse without Christ. Guilty. Vile, separated from God's love. The law was given. Transgressors are living under a curse. But the good news is God loves the transgressor, the sinner so much that He gave His only begotten Son. That that would bring us to grace and God's love, forgiveness. I've lived the last 20-something years under grace. And their blessings. Listen, as a church body, we have so much to offer the world in Christ. Well, how did Jesus use the law? Did He? When Jesus preached, He took the law in the book of Matthew. And He says, that one that His anger against His brother without cause is guilty of murder. Jesus took the law and He expanded it. He expanded the law to make sin so sinful. And then He took sexual morality and He gave the expansion to it. And He says to that one that even looks upon a woman with lust is guilty of adultery. Even a single lie your whole life makes you a liar. I have a feeling I'm sitting in church with a bunch of liars, adulterers, and murderers. Anybody say amen? amen. By the Word of God. You see, this is a beautiful thing. I know you're, some of you are saying, you not call me an adulterer. After church, I'll run. I don't, you can't get me. No. But Jesus spoke it to the Pharisees. See, we even have a lot of Pharisees this day. They say, well, I'm not as bad as you. My sin is not as bad as yours. That one is a bad sinner. I'm not so bad. And Jesus expanded the law to put all under the same category. One thing we must do as loving believers in Christ is say we're all the same. We're all under sin. For all of sin and falling short of the glory of God. There's not one of us here that's better than another. And there's not one here who's worse. 
we're all the same. Some sins have harsher consequences. But we're all sinners saved by grace, I pray. Jesus, by expanding the law, laid the question to rest. You cannot have a good enough life. See, a lot of times we want to go to church and be at church so often they grow cold to the Word of God. They say, well, you know, I, I go to church every Sunday. I have a good enough life. But Jesus reminds us in His parable that two men went to the temple. One went in and says, oh, I'm so glad I'm not as bad as that sinner. Another man went and he said, here I am, God, a sinner. Forgive me. The other, the first, was condemned. And Jesus said the repentant sinner went away justified. What Jesus put out for us is under the law. One, it brings us to guilt of sin. And the law brings us to a point we must accept that a good enough life is not good enough. The purpose of the law today is to bring people to understanding right and wrong. God's Word never changes. Here's the good news. You don't have to relearn what you've learned. Only what you forgot. Because it's never changing. Sin is sin and it does not change. And all have fallen short of the glory of God. And a reformed life doesn't cut it. A reformed life should be from grace. But if one would come and say, I have reformed without Christ, they're still lost. So the law brings us to sin, the exceedingly sinful. The law brings the lawbreaker to a place of God's wrath and misery without Christ. I want you to open your Bibles with me. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 6. God's chosen people led them through mighty things. They saw the hand of God probably more than any generation since. But many of them were stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and they still needed to learn so much. And the Lord came to them and reminded that they were living under the wrath of God because they were living a life without a faith and obedience. Verse 6. Therefore understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land possessed because of your righteousness. For you are a stiff-necked people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord. your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been a re rebellious people against the Lord. God brings them to the point to let them know even all the mighty things God did, they were still stiff-necked, hard-hearted, rebellious, and God's wrath was upon them. The greatest thing I fear this next year I'll be 49. Just a couple months. My son Tyson is four years old. 45 more years from now, I fear what the United States will look like for him. Anybody say amen? amen. If we think in our lifetimes, we don't see repentance of a nation if you think for a minute that the wrath of God won't come, we are dearly mistaken. To mankind, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why do we have the law? 
God loves you so much. God gave the law to convict of sin. God gave the law to teach us His ways. God gave the law that we would know the difference between right and wrong. God gave the law that we would govern the land by His law so we would live in a way that pleased Him. But God also, the other side of the coin, gives the law that those who walk against the law will know the wrath of God will come. The first thing the law was for is to bring us to grace. Hey, listen, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that I knew guilt was eating my soul alive. I knew I was guilty of sin and the multitudes of sin. And just like little Daniel, I had to go to the neighbor and confess and repent and ask for forgiveness. It was just so many years ago that I knew that my sin was in the face of God. I knew the guilt of the sin was eating me alive. And I had to go that one Sunday to that altar. And for the very first time, I knew of the Lord. I knew there was a God. And I knew His name was Jesus. But I never came to that point of such guilt. And guilt brought me to the point I needed relief. And that's called grace. Why do we preach sin? So people will find grace in Christ. Why do we preach God loves them so much that no matter what sin, God loves you and He died on that cross for your forgiveness. I couldn't believe the first time someone said, there's no sin in your life that God isn't ready to forgive. But he said, Daryl, there's only one sin that God will never forgive. I said, what's that? The rejection of Jesus Christ. And I knew I needed to make my life right with God. The law is beautiful. Without the law... I don't think any of us, I know, would ever come to Christ. The law leads us to Christ. But what about after? You say, okay, what good is the law for me? I'm a believer. I'm saved. I know Jesus. What is the good for? And I say, oh, so much and in so many ways. You see, once you know Christ, I pray that you want to live to please Him. I pray that you would want to live to love God in action. Say, God, I will show you my faith by my actions. I will show I love you, God. It will be shown in how I act, how I treat others, and how I live my life that they will say, I know there's a God in heaven leading that life. And the law leads our lives, so we live a life to please God. You see, on this side of grace, the guilt should be gone. And the love should be filled in the heart. No longer, God, am I guilty. I'm forgiven. No longer, God, am I like skinny cow, rejecting what's good for me. No, I'm like piggy cow, knowing how good you are. Forgive the symbolism. But God, on this side of the cross... I know how powerful your word is. And I live for it. Let's close in Galatians chapter 3. And we'll close this message. Verse 26. Under grace, under forgiveness, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the tutor brought us to guilt. Guilt brought us to repentance. Repentance brought us to the feet of Christ. And the Bible says, verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Of a son, we are a child of mighty God. We have a hope and a future. And we have a love for Christ and a love for God the Father and God the Holy Spirit now living in our lives, teaching us by the law how to live a life to please God. Verse 27. For as many of you were baptized into Jesus Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave or free. There is neither male or female. If you are all one in Christ Jesus... 
and if few are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Here's the best thing about God's law. It brings us under grace and under a promise. I believe with all my heart that my life is under the hand of God and has great promise. And I also believe with all my heart if your life is in Christ, God has great promises for you. God's blessings can never be counted. You say, well, how do we come to a place to walk in those blessings? And I say, by the law. The more you live according to God's Word, I have lived a life where God has blessed me more than I ever deserved. And I've also learned the more I love God, the more I try the best of my ability to live according to His law and His ways under grace. It's a good life. What more could we ever ask for anybody that they would have a life that God is a part of? So in closing this message, beloved, I just want to know, are you living in grace? Is the law to you the something that just brings guilt and condemnation? For God doesn't want you to live under guilt anymore. Christ died that you can live with forgiveness and promise. If you've never given your life to Christ, all it takes is to come and turn from sin and turn to Christ. And believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You shall be saved. 